This morning, I am going to talk about the story of Lazarus from John and what that, what that means. And just some, some questions as we get, we get going. So I'm going to read from John 11, verses 1 through 44. And just some thought, some thought questions as we, as, before we start getting into it too much. What are, what are your thoughts or questions that stick out to you as we read the scripture? So think about that as we're going through the scripture. We're basically going to go through the scripture today, and I've got some thoughts, and we'll just kind of talk about it as we go. What's this scripture say to you with all of the scary coronavirus talk going on? It's kind of scary out there, to be honest. And what is the scripture saying to you about that? Where are you putting your faith? What are you putting your faith in during these strange and challenging times? And then finally, I want you to think of the grossest, smelliest, nastiest, most rotten smell you can think of. And just hold that smell. Now, if you hold it too long, you'll, you'll, you'll start to bother you. But just remember it because we're going to come back to that a little bit later. Okay, so before we start going too far in, let's, uh, let's have a, a prayer this morning. Lord, thank you for bringing us all here this morning digitally. We lift up this sermon to you, Lord, dedicate it to you. Just invite your Holy Spirit to be here with us for those that are live and those that are watching the replay, Lord. Just we lift up the world during these times of strangeness and viruses, and we just lift them up to you, and we know that you're bigger than all of that, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, so let's get into the scripture this morning. So we're going to start at the beginning of John 11, and we start with, a man, now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped her feet, his feet with her hair, and it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. So Jesus these weren't strangers to Jesus. These were his friends. And Jesus, they're asking for his help. So now, what's Jesus going to do about that? When Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Wait, okay, so Jesus' friend and really good friend is sick. So normally when your friend is sick, what do you do? Well, normally you go visit them, particularly if it's a really serious illness. But Jesus does the opposite. He actually stays for two extra days. But he's got a plan in mind. And my first key this morning is that Jesus has his own timing. So even in the darkest of times, Jesus' timing is his timing. Hey, Jesus, we want you to do it this way, this way, this way. That's not the way Jesus works. God works differently. And his timing is completely different than ours. And we might not be able to even understand it. But his timing is very different. And we're going to talk more about that because that's a theme that's going to keep coming up as we read this scripture. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going to go there again? Aren't there 12 hours in a day, Jesus answered? If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. Jesus, or he said this, and then our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him up. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will get well. So now things kind of get confusing because the disciples, they don't really want to go back to Judea because Jesus almost got stoned, and I would assume they were also in that whole crowd. And so they're getting concerned about that, and so they're very worried. And now Jesus then is talking about day and night, and, and I'm not sure they're quite following him. But then Jesus says, okay, Lazarus, he's just falling asleep, so I'm going to go wake him up. So then the disciples are kind of like, it seems to me, they're, they're sitting there like, well, this is great. If he's asleep, then he's going to get better, and then we don't have to go, right? Like, there's just a lot of confusion. And so then Jesus has to settle that down. And so Jesus says, however, 
Jesus, however, was speaking about his death. This is Lazarus's death. But they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. So Jesus now is speaking plainly, although now it's even a little bit more confusing, I'm sure, for the disciples. Because now Lazarus is dead but we're still going to go so that we may believe. And if, I'm not sure the disciples are quite following what Jesus is doing and understanding Jesus' timing. And there's a lot of like concerns and this tension that's kind of building. And I think then we see that in verse 16, because Thomas does something weird. Then Thomas called twin said to his fellow disciples, let's go too, so that we may die with him. When I first read that, I was kind of like, what is Thomas talking about? What, what's he what's going on here? Now, I'm not a Bible scholar, so maybe there's more profound ways of looking at it. But as I see this scripture and as it's building, it seems to me that Thomas is being sarcastic. He's kind of being snarky. Well, then let's go to so that we can die. Lazarus is already dead. We're going to go and we'll just die with him then. I think he's being a little bit sarcastic. We don't really... Jesus doesn't really respond to Thomas. No one really does. And we just kind of move on with the story. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it kind of feels like there's a lot of this tension building and a lot of concern over this whole thing. And that's, that's what some disciples are responding because even in the worst thing, even the worst things can be for the glory of God. That's another key as we're moving through this. So even the worst things, it could be the coronavirus. It could be other life stuff. Any of that stuff can be for the glory of God. And that's, that's what we're going to see as we continue on with this story. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. So I don't know about you, but if something is dead for four days, it's going to stink. So remember at the beginning I said try to think of something that really smells? Think of that now, because that's what we're at. This body has been in this tomb. As a, as a homeowner, I have had the distinct privilege of having things die in my house. And a little tiny mouse, just yay big, can smell up the whole place. I can't imagine just a body in a tomb. I mean, that's just got to really smell. And we're going to come back to that more, too. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Man, look at Martha's faith. Your brother was again, Jesus told her. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Man, Martha's faith, she knows that Jesus could save him. She knows that Jesus could have saved Lazarus. She knows it. Why didn't he? There's a lot of distraught confusion kind of going on there. And then her faith is so strong, but even when, when she's talking about it, Jesus says he's going to rise again. She doesn't really think that Jesus is talking about right now. She thinks Jesus is talking about in the future. But man, Jesus is about to do some really cool stuff. But first we get to like verses 25 and 26 are probably the most important verses. And if you get anything from today, it's this. And this is the overriding theme. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe you are the Messiah, the son of God who comes into the world. This is why we're Christians. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We believe that. We believe that we're sinners and are dead and that Jesus is that resurrection and the life. But then that last question, that's kind of the zinger. Do you believe this? Do I believe this? Do we truly believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? And then if we believe it, do we live it? And the cool thing is that now Jesus is about to show everyone how he's the resurrection and the life. Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. As soon as Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were there with her in the house consoling her saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. 
they followed her, supposing that she was going to go going to the tomb to cry there. As soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. So we've seen Martha's faith, and now we see the same faith coming through with Mary. She too believes that Jesus could have saved him. So now we've got the two sisters that are distraught. Lord, you could have saved him. The crowd now is also with him. There's a lot of stuff going on, and I'm guessing it's a high-stress situation. And remember back, Jesus has his own timing. And now there's a big crowd here, and now Jesus is about to do something that this whole crowd is going to see because it's Jesus' timing and not ours and not theirs. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had been with her crying, he was deeply moved in in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also kept this man from dying? Jesus is moved by Mary and Martha. He really loved Lazarus. He really cared for his friend, and he cares about us, and he cares about us so much. And then in verse 25, the shortest verse in the Bible is also one of the coolest because it just shows Jesus' love for us. Jesus wept. He wept for Lazarus. He wept for the sisters, and he weeps for us. He loves us too. So the crowd is here, and and Jesus is just kind of feeling the this overwhelmingness in his spirit and things are real. This is real stuff. This isn't just a game. He's not just showing off his power. That's not what Jesus is doing. This is real life stuff. Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been dead four days. Yeah, I mean, four days in the tomb, it's going to stink, Lord. Are you sure? Like, even the faith now, it's like, I don't know what you're doing, Lord. You sure you know what you're like? What's going on here? You're about to have us open a tomb from somebody that's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this, so that they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. Lazarus is dead. The death that's in that tomb, that smell, that nastiness, that's our sin. And Jesus frees us from that sin and from that death, and he pulls us out of that tomb. He calls us out of that tomb by name. Nathan, come out. He's calling us out. Our sin, it's this horrible, nasty death, and it stinks. But Jesus is bigger than that, and he's bigger than our sin. Because remember, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's what Jesus says. Jesus asks that we surrender ourselves to him, that we give up our sin, that we give up our nastiness, that we give up our death, and that Jesus is going to take away that sin and that rot, and he's going to clean it up. Because frankly, we're the walking dead. We go walking around, but we stink. The world stinks. Sin is death, and it smells. And you can't just put deodorant on to cover it up. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus' blood on the cross and his death and his resurrection, he sets us free. That's what we're getting. We're getting closer and closer to Easter. And Easter is the greatest time because that is the time where we celebrate that Jesus died and then he rose again for us. Jesus saves us. Jesus is that resurrection and the life. Do I believe? It's that question, man. That question just, it's like a little zinger right in the heart. It's just like, 
man, do I believe that? And then if I do believe it, do I live it? As Christians, we believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But then I think about the rest of the world. With all this uncertainty that's going on, we've got the, the coronavirus stuff, and people are worried about their health, about their jobs, about their finances, about their kids, about their parents. Everyone, grandparents, everybody's worried right now. But remember, Jesus is bigger than any of that stuff. He's bigger than a virus. He's bigger than a government. He's bigger than a vaccine. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So my question is, what are we doing now? What am I doing now to show the world that Jesus is that resurrection and that life? As Christians, are we going around? Are we panicking? And it's scary out there. I'm not gonna, I'm not making light of that. It's scary. But how are we reacting? Are we really panicking or are we realizing, hey, Jesus is bigger than this? Hey, let's reach out to the neighbor, our neighbors. Hey, how you doing? Can I pray for you? Do you need something? As Christians, we need to be that calm voice in the storm. Hey, it's all right. We got it. It's okay. The church is here to help. Jesus is here. He's bigger than any of this. It's all right. We need to show the world this is our jobs as Christians. We got to show the world that we aren't scared of anything like this. Our faith is in Jesus. So my last question I'll leave you with here is, is what am I, what are we, what are you going to do this week to show your neighbors, to show my neighbors that Jesus is that resurrection and the life? How are we going to do that this week? Is it a phone call? Maybe doing an act of service? There's a lot of great organizations doing a lot of great stuff, so maybe it's helping them. Maybe it's just as simple as just pay, putting a phone call into the neighbors and seeing how they're doing. Because people are scared. And if they're not Christians, I don't know how you do it if you're not a Christian, honestly, because without Jesus, I don't know how you do it. Because it's scary out there. But Jesus is so much bigger than that. So what are we going to do this week? And it won't just be this week, I suspect. It's going to have to be an ongoing thing. What are we doing to show that light and to show that Jesus is the resurrection and the life to our neighbors? Because even the worst things can be for the glory of God. And remember that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Let's close with prayer. Lord, thank you this morning. You are the resurrection and the life. You are bigger than any kind of virus. You're bigger than anything that's going on in the world. You hold the world in your hands, Lord, and we thank you for that. Jesus, we lift up the folks watching, the folks that will watch, we ask that you let us be a calm in the calm voice in the storm. Let us show that you are the resurrection and the life to this world. Lord, we just invite your wisdom as we decide how to interact with people this week, people that are scared. Lord, we also ask for peace and calm as we get scared ourselves because it's scary out there, Lord. We're not always sure what's going to be happening, but you're bigger than any of that. And we thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've done. We thank you that you are the true resurrection and the life. We thank you as we get closer and closer to Easter, that celebration of your resurrection, that you're so much bigger and that you died and you rose again for our sins, for my sins, Lord. And you call me out of that tomb by name. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. In the name of Jesus, Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Blessings to you all as you go about your day. Stay safe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to post them wherever you see this video. If you need something, post them in the video. Somebody will find you. Somebody will help you out. And we just invite you. You to just have a blessed day and realize and remember that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Blessings to you.